Um, as always, I'll start off with some numbers. As of this morning, we are currently taking care of 64 patients as inpatients across our system who are positive for COVID-19 um, and being tr treated for COVID-19. Um, once again, we have at least one patient at each of our nine acute care hospitals. So there are eight at A.R. Gould Hospital, one at Blue Hill Hospital, one at C.A. Dean Hospital, 34 at Eastern Maine Medical Center, four at Inland Hospital, six at Maine Coast Hospital, one at Mayo Hospital, eight at Mercy Hospital, and one at Sebastopol Valley Hospital. In addition, we are to those, we are also taking care of 16 patients at their home who are positive for COVID-19 through our home care and hospice agency. Our two-week positivity rate now stands at 16.2% with a one-week positivity rate at 16.25%. We have also made available our most recent COVID-19 hospitalization graphic. The numbers continue to show that those who are vaccinated have lower cases of hospitalizations and severe illness. As we noted before, this Graphic represents a snapshot in time and the data is changing constantly. Uh, the graphic, which, is in, which includes data compiled from this morning, will be shared in the chat. On Monday, the CDC announced new guidelines for isolation and quarantine after COVID-19 infection or exposure for the general population. These changes shorten the length of time that people who do not have symptoms should stay isolated after exposure or infection. We've received a lot of questions about these changes and we want our patients and their families to understand the new guidelines and why these changes were made. As the pandemic has evolved, the response of public health officials, hospitals, and others has also evolved. We continue to learn more about the virus every day, including the Omicron variant, which is now the dominant strain in the United States. For example, we know that most of the transmission of the virus occurs early in the course of illness, one to two days before the onset of symptoms and two to three days after. The Omicron variant produces symptoms and positive test results more quickly than other variants. Simply put, the unique characteristics of Omicron and our greater knowledge and understanding of the virus have resulted in the changes we're about to discuss. To understand these changes, there are three important things to remember. First, if you test positive for COVID-19, you should isolate for a minimum of five days. If on the sixth day you have no symptoms or your symptoms are resolving, isolation can, can end but only if you continue to wear a well-fitting mask for five days after that to minimize the risk of infecting others. Second, if you're exposed to COVID-19 but have not yet received a positive test, do one of the following. If you are unvaccinated or more than six months out from your second Pfizer or Moderna dose or more than two months out for your Johnson & Johnson vaccine and have not yet received your booster shot, quarantine for five days, following, followed by strict mask use for an additional five days. If you have received your booster shot or are less than six months out from your Pfizer, vac Pfizer or Moderna vaccine dose, or less than two months out from your Johnson & Johnson, you do not need to quarantine following an exposure, but you should wear a mask for 10 days after the exposure. Lastly, anyone who is exposed should be tested for SARS-CoV-2 at day five after exposure. Symptomatic individuals should immediately quarantine until a negative test confirms symptoms are not caused by COVID-19. Vaccination continues to be our best way to protect yourself and reduce the impact of COVID-19 on our communities. If you still have, haven't been vaccinated or need a booster shot, visit our website or check with your local healthcare provider or pharmacy for an appointment. These changes also affect the business community. We understand the staffing challenges that many local businesses are facing and the challenges that employees face when required to stay home from work. We urge businesses to develop plans that keep staff and customers safe while keeping services open and available. The chance to return to work sooner is a wonderful opportunity for many, but can only be successful if staff are allowed to take time off when sick, recover, and have access to masks to protect themselves and customers. Northern Light Health offers twice monthly Good Health is Good Business Zoom event for free to help business leaders navigate COVID-19. The next session is on January 13. Register online at northernlighthealth.org. Finally, what I've shared today is not a complete list of the guidelines and it does not include changes to isolation or quarantine for health care workers. The CDC website is a great resource for even more detailed information, especially if you're experiencing symptoms or think that you have been exposed. And now I'll turn it over to Paul for some updates on staffing. Thanks, Dr. Jarvis. Um, so big update uh, from last week is uh, FEMA ambulances. So the federal government uh, announced that FEMA would deploy uh, eight ambulances to Maine. Um, and currently there are two ambulances in Bangor shared between Eastern Maine Medical Center and St. Joseph Hospital. 
Uh, the ambulances and crews began their service yesterday uh, and will continue that service through January 28th. Um, and they'll be focused on transporting between healthcare facilities, not 911 calls. Um, and so additional resources are always welcome. And while there are barriers uh, that remain, including long, uh, lack of long-term beds uh, to transport patients uh, to, every bit of support makes a difference. And we're grateful these crews are here and welcome them to Maine. Um, we do expect to have some video clips of at least one of the crews uh, and one of the ambulances uh, later today. If you'd like, like access to that, please let us know in the chat and we'll send you that link. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Jarvis for questions. Hey, um, Paul, one quick uh, thank you, uh, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Jarvis. Paul, uh, one of the media has requested if you could tilt your camera down just slightly so that your head is more towards the top. And does that? Um, I think that looks good. Thank you. All right, sure. You get okay. lots of praise in the chat there, Paul. So good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I think what we're going to do first is I do not see Brittany McHatton in the uh, in the chat room, so I'm going to go right to um, w uh, TV7 uh, and Blake Lipton has typed in his questions, uh, so I'm going to read them. Uh, Paul, this may be a question for you. Dr. Jarvis, jump in if, uh, if, if you have some in insight too, but it's about the federal ambulance. And the question is, how will the federal COVID ambulance play a part in what Northern Light is doing and how will they implement that? And so the ambulances, um, the two ambulances are working uh, between St. Joseph Hospital and EMMC um, and they're transporting patients uh, within the region, not just between those two facilities, but they're, they're stationed at those two locations. And we're working uh, to ensure that that's, that's assisting um, more prompt uh, uh, transport of patients from, from one location to the next as they need higher levels of care if, if cases become more critical or as patients um, uh, uh, don't, as they migrate to different needs of uh, different levels of care, um, they'll transport to different facilities, long-term care and the like. Um, so it certainly frees up um, additional uh, land-based crews that we have to transport patients uh, from facility to facility around the state, um, which is always a positive thing. Uh, and so we're, we're certainly happy to have that support. Paul, I think you may have already answered this. Um, was multitasking, so I might have missed it. How soon will they be operating uh, if the, they aren't already? The, the uh, FEMA ambulance crews started yesterday, and they'll be operating through January 28th. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so next up, we are going to go to David Marino from Bangor Daily News. David, please ask your questions when you're unmuted. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Jarvis, uh, do you feel like the current uh, you know, supply and price of at-home coronavirus tests in Maine is adequate given the, you know, the crisis the state is facing? Yeah, so unfortunately, no, it's not um, adequate supply of at home testing um, and even rapid testing uh, through other facilities, unfortunately, across the country is in short supply. Um, and we're certainly not uh, um, immune to that here in Maine. And so um, we wish there was a greater supply and are hopeful that the federal government will be able to meet uh, some of the goals that they have put in place for increasing that supply so people can get tested sooner, um, particularly if they're symptomatic or have had an exposure. Great. Thanks for answering that. And my second question is, there were 1,325 coronavirus cases reported by the Maine CDC this morning. Um, you know, that, that there's a great, greater likelihood, to me, it seems that an even higher percentage of the population is currently carrying the virus. Um, you know, many are be testing positive through at-home tests, as well as there are people who may be asymptomatic. Um, does that seem like the case to you? The, you know, is there really any way to know how many people in our community are testing positive and are rapidly spreading this virus? No, and that's the reason why we tend to follow trends and, and our positivity rate through our own testing uh, facility here at Northern Light Lab, um, because that helps us to get a better picture of what's going on in communities. And again, with that high rate of community spread and the fact that each of our acute care hospitals now currently has at least one patient who's being cared for for COVID-19 symptoms, um, just really says that, 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 that statewide we are still seeing significant spread. Um, as you you know, point out, um, you know, the test results that get reported out by the state are those that are run by, you know, agencies such as the state lab, our lab, and other 
um, labs and often do not include the fact that people test positive with their home test and then don't report those cases out. So yes, those are typically an underreported number. And plus remember, typically when the state reports those numbers, those are ca new cases that they have reported to them and may not actually represent what happened the day before. It may actually be a couple of days be before that, well, you know, when somebody had a positive test. So always, you know, look, look for trends is probably better than looking at the actual number of the day. Thank you very much, David. Patty White, you're up. Uh, thanks. I got a question about the uh, ambulance crews. Even though they've only been there for a day, um, have they reduced wait times yet, or can you tell us how many transfers they've done? Dr. Jarvis, I don't. I don't have that information. Do you? Do you, Dr. Jarvis? I do. I do not have that information. Um, we we talked briefly about that they were in place uh, as of yesterday um, on incident command call this morning, but uh, but didn't put in specifics. If we can get those for you, we'll let you know. Okay, thanks. Um, and then, Dr. Jarvis, just a little bit more on the new guidance from the CDC about isolating and quarantining, um, because there are some people who, um, you know, disagree with these new guidelines. Uh, do you feel that they should be broadly applied to people who test positive, or do you think there should be some nuance? I mean, basically, you know, if people can isolate or quarantine longer, um, is that ideal, or do you think, you know, this this should apply to everyone? Yeah, I think I think if everybody could follow what the actual guidance is, then that's really what what would allow that guidance to be effective. And I think you know that's where um, there's been some controversy is whether people will actually follow the guidance or on day five when they're no longer in quarantine, you know, will they go out about their business without wearing a mask? And the key is is that you have to do both parts of it, right? You have to be in that isolation for the recommended period of time and then do the precautions of. And we're not just talking about wearing a mask when you're inside in a public place. We're talking about wearing a mask when you're outside of your home at all times. Um, and so that's different than the guidance we've given, you know, for just general protection. So I think that's where, where some public health experts are. They wish that, you know, the guidance was a little bit different. The other confusion there, too, is that remember that the, some of the guidance only applies to individuals who have either recently been vaccinated or received their booster shot. And therefore, again, there's always that, 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 that the subset of people um, who may just not follow the guidance at all. And, and, you know, it only works when we all follow the guidance. Thank you very much, Patty. Next up, we are going to Mel Meyer from WGME. Yeah, so um, going back to a little bit about what, what Patty was asking about and changes to wait time uh, with the, the FEMA ambulances, what do you expect to be the biggest benefit from having these FEMA teams? I can speak to that. The, the biggest benefit really is that they're freeing up um, our ground crews to take care of patients in other settings, um, providing that, that extra support um, at a time where we have uh, staff with community exposures and illnesses taking them from work, um, having a, a, you know, a, a pair of hands that are well-skilled uh, in addition to having the ambulance uh, uh, to help them transport patients really will, will help our ground crews uh, tend to other, to other patients uh, in other situations. And so it, it just provides that much more flexibility um, so that we can react very quickly um, for our needs regarding COVID um, but also have the capacity uh, to, to assist our communities with other ground transport needs. And then my second question is about a surge in cases. I know that we were already experiencing basically a tidal wave of new cases here in Maine and, and hospitalizations. Uh, when do you expect to see cases going up because of the holidays? And what, are, what is Northern Light doing right now to prepare for a surge? So um, each and every day, each of our hospitals, uh, um, has its own incident command that actually goes through what their staffing issues are, what their, their patient census is, and what their needs are for the coming day, as well as looking forward to the, to the future um, of the week. Um, and then in addition to that, we have our system level incident command that daily is working behind the scenes to help support those hospitals. Um, so we continue to do that, and we have not changed that approach since really early on in the, in the pandemic, um, and that continues to, to serve not only our hospital system well, but also the communities that we serve and the patients that we serve. Uh, so we will continue to do that. As to when we expect the next huge wave, you know, we're in a big wave right now. Um, we continue to see uh, high numbers of, of cases, uh, both and people who are infected and people who need hospitalization. And so we continue to do that. With Omicron, it's still a good guess as to when we would see a wave that, that um, you know, follows holiday gatherings um, because we, it seems as if uh, the Omicron virus um, certainly uh, um, gets people sicker faster and therefore that they're infectious faster and therefore they will spread the disease faster. Um, that's what we've seen in other countries. It's what we see in some other parts of the United States. 
and expect that we will see the same, uh, you know, this week, next week, and probably the, the few weeks following New Year's. Thank you for your questions, Mel. Uh, now we're going to go to uh, Spectrum News Maine with Sean Murphy. Hi, thanks for the time. Uh, just a quick question about hospitalizations. Uh, I know that we've seen uh, from Maine CDC, uh, hospitalizations peaked uh, about a week ago today, but they've dropped off a bit since then. Just wondering if that has had any kind of impact on you guys at all. Have you noticed a drop off in cases in your hospitals? And if so, is it a significant enough one to impact the uh, the, the difficulties you guys might have with staffing or, or maintaining care or, or not so much? Yeah, I think we have seen a little bit of a decrease in patients who are not requiring critical care, but the ones that require critical care numbers are still about where they have been um, for quite some time now. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a short reprieve for us, but at the same time, we continue to see an increase in patients who require um, hospitalization for other reasons. Um, and because of that, we continue to have some of the same, uh, you know, um, staffing and capacity concerns that we've had uh, for pretty much since the end of the summer. Um, so that has not changed, uh, but we've been able to manage and take care of most individuals, um, particularly those that have the need for a higher acuity of care. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sean. Uh, do you have a follow-up, Sean, or are you all set? I, I th I'm all set, thank you. Oh, great, thanks. Okay, next up, we're gonna go to Portland Press Herald. Joe Lally, you should be able to unmute now. Hi, uh, Dr. Jarvis. Um, based upon uh, what has been happening in other countries and maybe in other places where the Omicron variant has taken over, um, do you expect um, the severity of the virus to be somewhat reduced in comparison to Delta? And if so, what does that mean for hospitalizations and, and the average hospitalized patient? Does that mean that patient is less likely to have a severe case? Yeah, it's an excellent question, Joe. And of course, you know, only time will tell us the answer to that. Uh, the more data that we've been getting, particularly out of the United Kingdom, seems to suggest that Omicron is causing less severe disease and hospitalizations, in, at least in adults, um, which would be a welcomed trend for us. But if it was to infect more people, the overall number of hospitalizations may not go down and in fact may go up just simply because of, of, of a volume curve. Um, if we see more, more cases of people being infected with Omicron because clearly it is being shown to be more, much more infectious than, uh, than the Delta variant and certainly more infectious than the original strain we were dealing with almost two years ago. Okay, thanks. And my follow-up question is if, if you could expand a little bit on um, a, a previous uh, answer about uh, you're seeing more patients come in for other reasons. Is that because people put off care and so now they have worse problems? Could you explain that a little bit more? Sure. So it's actually a combination of things. So yes, it is, it is somewhat due to pe people who have delayed care um, or either necessarily or unnecessarily during the pandemic. Um, but also, you know, this is cold and flu season, uh, which means that we have other respiratory viruses that are out there. And so, we, you know, typically in the winter months, we do see an increase um, in volume in, in cases um, because of other, other conditions. Um, and also, you know, we have increases in trauma due to slips and falls and things like that. And so it's really just a, it's not one particular thing. It's, it's more of just a global concern. And something that we've talked about frequently on, on these uh, media briefings is that, you know, the state of Maine has always had a capacity issue when it comes to hospitalized patients. Um, and so no different, uh, it's just made more, more stressed due to, uh, the, due to the um, pandemic that we're going through. Thank you for your questions, Joe. Next up is uh, Chris Costa from New Center, Maine. Chris? Hi, Dr. Javis and uh, Mr. Boland, appreciate the time. Uh, wanted to ask one quick question uh, to start. I've seen a, a, a post that's being shared by a lot of parents on Instagram. It's a, it's a, it's a doctor in New York City who's, who's talking about the number of child cases of COVID that they're seeing, uh, that the, the number of cases of hospitalizations for kids has quadrupled. I looked at the main data from uh, that was posted on Monday. We're not seeing that same trend. Now, I'm wondering if you guys can help us understand, you know, is that something we might expect to see in a couple of weeks, maybe after the holiday gatherings? Or is it just a population density thing that, that we may not encounter this issue at all? Yeah, Chris, I think that's an excellent question, but uh, anything I would say would really be speculative at this point. Um, really, it, we, only time is going to tell um, you know, where we will end up. 
Uh, I have seen that there's been at least a few, um, a slight increase in the number of hospitalizations in children. Um, thankfully for Northern Light Health, we have not seen that in our hospitals. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that might not happen. It's something that we need to be prepared for and look out for. Um, there is data to suggest uh, out of some other nations and in, in as you reported, um, other places around the United States where they are seeing that children are becoming sicker with the Omicron variant than we'd seen with previous variants. Um, and if, the, if, if, if it's true that the Omicron variant looks more like the, the coronavirus that causes common colds, that's not a surprising fact for us. We know that upper respiratory illnesses in children often are more severe than they are in adults. And so this may just be the next evolution of the coronavirus and the populations that it affects. In addition to that, we know that children under five are not eligible to be vaccinated. So it's yet another plea for everybody who is eligible to be vaccinated to get vaccinated. And if you're eligible for your booster shot to get your booster shot, because that helps to protect everybody who can't be vaccinated, including children under five, um, from coming in contact with somebody who's infected with Omicron. And therefore, we wouldn't have to worry about, uh, you know, whether or not it causes severe disease. The best prevention of severe disease is prevention of disease in the first place. Vaccination is our best hope. Dr. Jarvis, before I change topics, can I just ask you one quick follow up on this? Sure. Is 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 there any indication? I, I know that what we trend wise, we're expecting. Okay, after the holiday gatherings, we should see the hospital. Sorry, the cases go up, then the hospitalizations, possibly the deaths. Would would it be? What, what kind of advice would you give a parent who has to send a child back to daycare? Would you encourage them to wait until after, say, a two week incubation period, if they can, to to avoid sending their child to daycare? I I don't know. It's just something that kind of popped into my head. Yeah, I think that's that's an individual decision, and certainly there's lots of factors that would bear on that. Um, right now, there is no uh, uh, guidance um, that suggests that that's something that people should be doing. I think you know you should be making sure that wherever your child is either going to, to child care or to school, you know that they are following the guidance of uh, wearing masks when appropriate, social distancing when appropriate, staff being vaccinated, all those kind of good things that we've talked about. Um, you know, those are the safest methods that we can talk about right now. Chris, I know you had one more question, but to be fair to everybody, I'm going to run through and give everyone two first. If we have time, yep. I'll get to your last one. Totally cool. Um, um, uh, so next up is going to be uh, Talia Clark from WMTW. Talia. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, Dr. Jarvis, I just wanted to know how many Maine children are currently being hospitalized with symptoms of COVID-19 at Northern Light Health Hospitals? So um, at this time, I'm not aware of any children uh, specifically being treated for COVID-19. Um, again, uh, that, that from, from what I've learned from this morning, things could certainly change. Um, but I do not believe currently we are caring for anybody who is actively ill with COVID-19 uh, who is under the age of 15. And um, have those numbers been pretty much the same or has there been a decrease in the number of children needing to be hospitalized with symptoms of COVID-19 during the pandemic? It has fluctuated from time to time. Again, Maine's been pretty fortunate when it comes to children with severe disease, uh, but unfortunately, you know, we have had children who have re required intensive care and unfortunately children who have died from COVID-19. Um, uh, but thankfully here in Maine, our numbers have been relatively low and we hope that continues. Okay, thank you for your questions, Talia. Now we're gonna go up to uh, uh, Rebecca Alley from Ellsworth American. Yes, hi. Um, thank you for your time. I just have one question. Um, with some reports that the Omicron variant could cause some COVID cases to uh, see more cold-like, is the screening process changing for patients going into Northern Light hospitals? Um, we heard from one reader a couple weeks ago that her mother, who had a negative rapid test, had to wait in her car for the results of a hospital-given test before she could uh, go inside the hospital to be treated for, for some flu and respiratory symptoms. Yeah, without knowing the specifics of that case, I certainly can't comment it, but we have not changed our either our visitation requirements or the requirements of screening uh, for both patients and those accompanying our patients and our staff for that matter. So right now, um, visitation and staffing and, uh, and other screening requirements remain the same as what the CDC had recommended before, and we continue to follow those. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Rebecca. Um, Chris, I, we do have, uh, everyone was very efficient today. We have about a couple of minutes left. So Chris, if you have um, one final question, I, I think you will have time to take it. 
Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Jarvis, I, I, you, you sort of addressed this already, but I just wanted to put a more finer point on it. You know, there, a lot of people have been uh, critical of the US CDC and its messaging, uh, the consistency, the kind of back and forth. Um, and I know that, as you said, because we're learning as we go through this pandemic, that's natural to happen. Um, but there are people who are concerned that these new guidelines are more about getting people back to work than they are about public health. What is your sense of that, and and which side of the fence do you stand on? Yeah, you know, I don't I don't stand on either side. You know, I my job here is to report what you know what what uh, we are currently doing for Northern Light Health, and to to um, you know lend some some voice to both the federal and the main CDC. Um, and so, in in that regard, uh, you know, I, I I certainly have no insight into into the decision making other than what is being reported. Um, again, I think these guidelines would work if everybody was to follow them. I think most of the criticism or concerns that I've seen raised uh, by public health officials was around the fact that that how do we ensure that those who are not vaccinated or not yet boosted um, are following the guidance for that particular group of individuals uh, versus those who have their booster shots. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a public policy situation and, and not one really that, uh, that healthcare systems uh, can participate in other than to encourage vaccination um, and to be here to vaccinate individuals who want to be vaccinated and keep our doors open for those who need us for other medical conditions.